The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Hey guys, it's Chris Waters here, the author of the Million Dollar Real Estate Team. Welcome to my podcast, CEO Secrets. I've got a special guest on the podcast today, um, Laurel uh, Starks. She is the um, uh, broker and owner of a, a real estate brokerage in Southern California, where she has closed $180 million in sales uh, going after the divorce niche and has um, founded the Alumni Institute, where she helps teach agents how to follow in her footsteps and dominate this niche to grow their business. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Laurel. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I have a lot of questions for you. I, I hope um, I hope you're ready. I am far away. So how, how long have you been in real estate? When did you get started? I got started in the real estate business in 2005. So we're going on 15 years. In and, and that's in Southern California right after the market crashed. Got it. So I got in right when it was at the top and I was trying to figure out, you know, like what is a purchase agreement? What does even escrow mean? What is title insurance? And by the time I started to figure that out, the whole bottom just dropped out. <laughs> and I had to learn how to climb in uh, against the wind, as they say. What, um, I guess to go back just maybe a little bit before you got started, what were you doing pre real estate? Were you a real estate attorney? Like what, like how did, you know, you went, you went after this divorce niche, like what, what was going on, you know, your, in your career prior to real estate? Yeah, that's the interesting thing. So I was a flight attendant. I flew for Northwest Airlines. I flew internationally and domestic uh, for 10 years prior to getting into real estate. When my kids were one and three, I decided I did not want to be on a plane flying all over creation. I wanted to uh, figure out a job that I or a career that I could be at home and had a little flexibility and that kind of thing. So I got into real estate. Um, it's not an uncommon thing for flight attendants to migrate. I don't know why from flying to real estate. And so uh, then my I did so I did not have I am not a product of divorce. My, my, uh, my husband and I have been happily married, knock on wood, going on 22 years. And um, I did not know much of anything about divorce. So uh, I come from complete, let's say, a blank slate. Uh, yeah, I, those are all very interesting data points because like you basically, you know, developed this niche and mastery from the ground up, right? Yeah. And, yep. and, and you've, and you, and you know, you, you were, um, you, you've gone through extensive training around divorce mediation and collaborative divorce and dealing with, you know, super high conflict matters. Yeah. Right. And there's a bunch of training you were going through and, you know, I guess right after the crash, right. Is that kind of what yeah. happened? So, uh, so what happened, my, my second listing I ever took was a divorce case. And I, my husband and I had some friends, they were attorneys. The husband was a family law attorney and, um, he called me one day on his way home from court and he said, I've got you appointed to a case and you're to sell the house. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And he said, well, my client, uh, she is ordered to sell the house and they're going through a divorce. The parties could not agree on a realtor. And so I selected you, um, they gave your name to the judge and the judge agreed. And so you've got to sell the house in this divorce. I'm, I'm going to totally interrupt my whole flow of asking you to tell me about kind of your career trajectory, but I can't help myself because like I've been dying to ask this question for a long time. So one of the most frustrating things about being an agent when you get a client that is going through divorce is the, you know, the attorney wants like, you know, three, four, five, six names of real estate agents. And when it's, you know, very, when there's a lot of tension between the, um, the two, uh, you know, a lot of times it's like a lottery who the uh, judge, you know, decides to list the house, which is super frustrating. And so I, I've been waiting a long time to ask you this. How do you overcome that? How do you like, how do you win that battle and win the business? That's a great question. You have to stand out. 
you have to look like you're different than another realtor. So this isn't about being just a great realtor. It's about having a specialization in the divorce space. Mm -hmm. So that is how I win them now. Um, you know, it's, it, you, you start with the attorneys and, um, a lot of times what judges order is that one attorney gives the other attorney three names and then that other attorney chooses from those three. And usually the way that they choose, you submit some sort of a proposal or they call it a CV, a curriculum vitae. It's like a beefed up resume and they go through your resume and they see who has the best credentials. So if you've got credentials, especially in this space that would trump uh, another realtor who maybe is a great realtor, but doesn't know how to navigate through these, these high conflict cases, um, then you'll, you'll have a leg up. So, and, and so what's kind of cool is through the Illuminati Institute, you created a designation for agents to get called the certified distressed, I'm sorry, certified divorce real estate expert designation. And, 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 and I assume in that course, you get to learn how to build a really amazing resume. <clears throat> and it is the alumni Institute. Alumni. Um, we do believe that we are as, uh, as especially important as the Illuminati, but we are the alumni Institute. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, yes, that is exactly why we exist. We exist to empower, educate and provide the backing of our realtors so that they can have the credentials and they can have the credibility to stand out when they're in those situations, 100%. So, and, and I apologize again, I interrupted you. You were, you were saying you got in real estate full time when your early listings was an expired. And then I know just your backstory that you went through this, all this extensive training to become an expert. Yeah. But um, was, was it that listing that caused you to, you know, be like, okay, I need to go get training on how to handle these type of situations. Is that where it all started? Yeah. So I, you know, I come from this back, I mean, in the, in the airline industry, before you ever get to be on a flight, um, you're in like this boot camp for six to eight weeks and you learn absolutely everything about the entire fleet all the way down to which drawer they keep Coke versus the orange juice. And so you learn everything before you go on that plane. And in real estate, it's not that way. And that was kind of a little shocking to me. You get into real estate and you like get these listings, which is some of these largest asset and you figure it out on the fly. So mm -hmm. I, um, I wanted to feel more comfortable uh, in how to handle this. And it was an interesting situation because the wife in this case had to move to Portland in 30 days because her son had to start school. And the husband, he told me to pound sand and he was never going to talk to me and he was never going to sign anything I put in front of him. And he was true to his word. He just n didn't call me back. He didn't do anything. I didn't know what to do. I know I can't sell a house without everybody's signature on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a court order and what do you do? So, um, I, I realized pretty early on that there was an additional level of knowledge that I didn't have that I needed. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, I, I can't personally, when I was, when I was a producing agent, I can't tell you how many times that happened to me, right? Like the significant other thought I was on the other opposing party's side not looking out for the best interests, super incredibly frustrating. So you, you gained all this expertise and you built up this mega team, eight buyers, agents, multiple, you know, staff members, inside sales. And, you know, for uh, over a decade, you were just crushing it. And, and, but at a certain point you decided to go start this Institute to help people master this niche. Right. So I decided that, you know, I've got all of this divorce business and I've got all of these listings. And what do they say about building a business, a real estate business? If you've got listings, then they beget leads. Mm -hmm. And yet I didn't really have a lot of time to handle all the leads that I was getting. I mean, um, 
signs going in the front yard, sign calls, internet leads, all of these things. And so I decided to build a sales team specifically to handle those leads and that business. So that's what I did. And I, I, yeah, I grew it. I had ISAs, I had a robust admin team and you name it, the whole thing. Yeah. What, what were some of your, um, what were the key dominoes to getting divorce leads, people that needed to sell? Like, were you calling, uh, were you calling attorneys, building relationships with attorneys? Were you, um, you know, getting divorce records at the county courthouse and cold calling people? What were your, your methods from a lead generation perspective? It is a re- attorney referral based business. That's how I have built it. Um, because it, you know, attorneys, number one, have a lot of influence over their clients. And so a lot of times the attorneys can, uh, somebody could be recommended, but then another attorney vetoes that or whatever. Um, and then the other thing is, is that there needs to, there, there is a legal process going on. So like there needs to be a, um, there needs to be a, like an or like an order by the court. There needs to be an agreed stipulation. People don't always have authority to list and list the house. You know that kind of thing. So um, that's the reason why you really want it to be an attorney an attorney based business. So let me ask you something. So if, for the people watching this that are trying to get to a position where they're no longer producing agents, they are actually operating as CEOs, yeah. and they don't want to have to go out there and develop relationships with attorneys, they would rather hire somebody to do that. Do you feel like like you could hire a, call it a business development rep to basically go and nurture these relationships and win business? Definitely. Um, you. What I would recommend somebody who has a team, and this is when we train people who have, who have teams. You know, we have people like you who say, you know what, I want to open up a, di- a like a divorce leg of my business. Then they would send somebody to us, and we educate them, and they get certified so that they can talk the talk. They know how to speak to attorneys. They know what attorneys need. Mm-hmm. But it's not just about the lead generation generation techniques. It's also about being able to handle the business when they get it. So getting these listings in high conflict situations is tricky. And so it needs to be somebody who also understands how to handle the processes and the protocols, navigate through that legal system when you get stuck in Mm -hmm. in high conflict. So if you're, let's say again, you're you're like the the team leader trying to maintain that CEO position, not get into a producing role. Right. Um, let's say you, you hire a business development rep, pay for them to go through your classes and you know, they go out there and develop these relationships, start bringing in business and then they leave you that sales rep business development rep leaves you. Um, is there a way to maintain the relationship with the organization or do you think it'll follow the business development person? Yeah, that's the big, uh, you know, any rainmakers fear, right, is that under the, on their dime, under their watch, uh, they've developed a, a whole leg of business that is at risk at that point that could go out the door and then those relationships follow. So lawyers are very loyal people. Once you get in with them, it's a lot to get in. There's a big barrier to entry, but once they get in, they're very loyal and they will very likely go with whoever they have built their relationship with. So basically this is one of those lead generation strategies where you're taking a risk, hiring somebody, hoping they're going to stay with you a long time. Um, Or you, the rainmaker need to go develop those relationships. Is there a lot of maintenance required once you actually like secure the relationship? Like, do you know, are you still having to regularly meet with the attorney and stuff? So like the Legion, like the, the touch program. Yep. yep. Yeah. So what I do is, and what we, what we teen and teach and train is that we do pop buys. It's very similar to kind of the Buffini model. We do um, attorney events twice a year. We do pop buys. We go, we take them to lunch. Uh, we do lunch and learns. 
Um, we send them attorney specific emails for real estate, things that are very specific to real estate matters as it impacts family law and newsletters. So we touch them by mail, we touch them by email, we touch them in person and we keep up. It's just good old fashioned business to business network. Yep. How, um, like, let's say for example, I, I don't know if you have these stats, just total curiosity. If let's say, for example, there's a hundred attorneys in, um, in your market, hundred attorneys that specialize in divorce. Um, how many business development reps would you need to hire on your team to basically dominate that market to maintain the relationships with a hundred different divorce attorneys? One. Just one? Yeah. Do you feel like that's the, what, what's like the, the ceiling? Like how many relationships can a, uh, if you were to hire a business development rep on your team to go after divorce leads, how many, what's the max, max number of attorneys they could um, work, you know, be maintaining a relationship with? Well, uh, let me, let me answer that question with a question. Um, so when you say business development, who is that same person handling the business? So when, uh, when, when, when they get assigned a case, mm -hmm then the person who gets assigned a case is going to be that person that the lawyer has the relationship with. Mm -hmm. So that person will get assigned a case and then there's the handling of that case. So that's where it's, mm -hmm. it is tough to just sort of plug the, plug that, you know, or, you know, pawn that off to like a, uh, maybe a, <clears throat> you know, $10 an hour TC or something mm -hmm. or, you know, it, 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 there is skill that is needed to handle the business as well. So let me ask you a question about that. So what if, what if in order to like help preserve the business to stay within the organization, you hired a business development rep to go after and build those relationships and their full-time job is like getting the business in the door and they're certified distressed. I'm, I'm sorry, I keep saying distress. Um, a certified divorce real estate experts, right? And then yep. they also have working in tandem with them a high quality transaction coordinator. It doesn't make 10 bucks an hour, but makes like 20, 25 an hour. And they're also, you know, they have the certified divorce um, expert designation. Um, and then, you know, basically that TC handles the workload on behalf of the agent. Is that is that a possible workflow? Yeah. You know? So if, So I'll tell you what I do. Um, because I'm highly leveraged in my real estate business. And so what I do, I am the person who does have those relationships. So if you will, you know, on the Chris Waters team, you could have somebody who is that person who goes out and builds those relationships. So I am that person in, on my, in my business. And once a listing, when, when we get a listing assigned, it starts with my uh, my associate who is she she's she would be that second person you're talking about she does an intake she starts building the file she schedules me to do a walkthrough she schedules me to do a listing appointment those are the only two areas that I'm involved so I go do a walkthrough I come back I sit I do a listing appointment in my office and then she handles everything else so once the list, I'm, I'm only in the listing appointment for about 20 minutes. And then she handles all of the paperwork, the signing of it, everything to closing. She handles all of that, including offers, appraisals, repair negotiation, all of the guts of the real estate business. She handles all of that. So that's one way that it could, that it could work. So you think maybe perhaps the CEO of the team could hire a business development rep and operate like you, be the listing agent, maintain the attorney relationship, go to the appointment, win the business, and then hand it off to a, you know, probably more well-paid TC to do all the back end work. And then maybe it creates some more stickiness with the team. Yeah. And so I think what can happen is the team can also be responsible for, um, if you think of like a like a title company. So title reps that come around, they've got, you know, printed material, right? And the title rep, the title company provides that for them. Um, the title company also will provide um, a lot of, you know, resources and stuff like that. So 
the team can provide that. The team could provide the news. They could handle all of the newsletters. They could figure out all of the pop by items. You could have just some admin on the team handling that stuff mm -hmm. so that the, the rep, it just comes by, fills up their trunk and goes. <laughs> and then they go out and they build those relationships. Um, all of the CRM that can all be handled within the organization. The touch points that go out, the, the team can handle all of that. I don't know that the business development rep has to be the real estate agent. Um, I think that the business development rep, if they are, they've got to be pretty competent to, to speak about real estate mm -hmm. because it's going to lunch with attorneys and attorneys are really picking your brain, you know, about real estate and the market and, and transactions and stuff like that. So it's needs to be somebody who has a good handle on that. Um, you, you mentioned you had an inside sales, you had some ISAs on your team. Um, were they prospecting attorneys booking appointments or what, what was the ISA focused on? My ISA was focused on handling the traditional side of real estate. So I had Boomtown, we had a Zillow spend, and we did all of our dial arounds for all of my listings. All inbound leads came to the, de to the ISA department for traditional. And then he would, they would set appointments for our sales team. So that side of the business actually was not involved in the divorce space. Got it. Okay, so I want to back up for a little bit. So you, you mentioned, you know, got started in real estate, got the divorce case, got a lot of education training on handling um, divorce cases. And um, I hope the thing that I can extract from you on this podcast is how you built the bridge from being you know, a successful agent to actually building a team. And like you said, becoming highly, highly leveraged. Like yeah. how, how did you do that um, as you were building out your team? Because, you know, you got, you're worrying about how much money's in the bank, you're hiring employees, like spending money on lead generation tech. Like what, what helped you build that bridge? What were the, the key secrets you learned to become a true CEO of your business? Yeah, so um, I would say that I have failed forward in that, probably like most of us that have tried it. Um, but what I, what I learned as I was going is that, and it sounds so obvious, but when you're out of production and when you are a CEO, that is a whole different skill set and a whole different job description. Mm -hmm. And what we learn as a, as a practicing in the trenches agent, those skills do not necessarily translate to being a good CEO. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a student of, uh, of Keller Williams, of Gary Keller. And, you know, there are many, many, many other uh, I'm not here to plug, you know, anything at all. I'm just my experience. There are many, many, John Maxwell is an excellent leadership. Uh, Patrick Clincioni. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, there are tons yeah. of Simon them. Sinek, yeah. So, um, so that was just, he was just my mentor of choice, but um, I learned, I, I learned hiring. I learned leadership and I learned training and so let me ask you a couple of things specific to those three areas. Yeah. What were your biggest ahas around hiring that caused you to have a breakthrough in selecting the right people? The biggest thing, if I had to put a finger on it and it's to this day is what I look for. And that is behavioral patterns. Do you feel like you can see that in the interview process or do you have to wait until they join the team to see it? Um, now that I, I can see a whole lot more now than I did before I had any kind of training or development in that I can see a lot more, but really at the end of the day, it's about the six month mark is when you can really tell if somebody has, is going to catch that stride. Uh, you can tell before then if somebody's just going to bomb, but I would say the six month mark is a big marker in whether or not they've got the stamina 
to keep up with me. So what's interesting is, and I agree with you on this like wholeheartedly is that, um, you, 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 you've got to pay attention to people's behavioral patterns. And I think the interview process is important, but I, you know, you actually see how committed people are from a behavioral perspective once they actually join the team and somewhere between, you know, sometimes you, you know, I think you can, you can cut off a lot of people in months one, two, and three, but you know, six months is a major inflection point when you're bringing on salespeople. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how they shut, how they show up. It's, it's everything, how, how they show up to represent themselves is going to be the highest ceiling that they're ever going to show up to represent me and my brand. So I'm looking for, I mean, everything it is how they email me, how, how well their spelling and punctuation is, how detailed their resume is how on time they are, what they're wearing, what are their facial expressions, how they completely, and I will sometimes also, um, like I might text somebody um, during the interview process and maybe I'll just switch up or change the, you know, our appointment time or something just to see how quickly they respond to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to see how they respond. Are they just responding with a, thumbs up or are they responding with um great that time works for me i'm really looking forward to seeing you too Mm -hmm. big difference Mm -hmm. so i'm looking at all of that i want to see their positivity i want to i want to feel the energy that they are uh that that they're you know emitting um i'm looking at all of that i I, I took, I had a big aha in a class I took years ago uh, with Seth Campbell. If anybody knows who Seth Campbell is. He's, Amazing guy. Yeah. Amazing guy. So um, I, I had the benefit of coaching with Seth and Seth, um, he was talking about how there are in the interview process, there are like two tracks going on at the same time. Um, so you know how like in animated movies, like the Lion King or whatever, Um, there are sort of two tracks going on. There's one for the kids that the kids understand. And then there's the other one for the adults. And it's the same movie going on at the same time, but there are like these messages. It's kind of the same thing where there's what they say, there's how they respond to the interview, but then there's this whole other track and level of, of behavior. And um, that is, that's what I've learned how to see and hear mm-hmm. is that. So let me move on to the training aspect. You now teach classes. You're very active, you know, um, with your, with the Institute you've created. Um, what, what have been some of your breakthroughs around, uh, a training agents to become successful? Um, you can, you know, you can lead a, a horse to water. That's one. Um, I thought that that I had to have when I had a team. I thought that I had to have training that was so comprehensive and all the way down to every single minute detail and i actually create i'm kind of a t te- i've got a i've got a teacher's heart and uh i created a very robust training program for my sales team and not to say that i'd say probably 70 percent of it was necessary and was good because i don't want numbnut agents representing me and they're a walking liability <laughs> um so I, it's important that i have that but um, there's a, there's that fine line between enabling and you, you teach somebody to become so dependent, um, that, that they then, you know, they can't think for themselves or do for themselves anymore because the training was almost too coddling. Does that make sense? You know, it's man, it is. So I love that you're saying this. I love it. Cause I, you know, when we started our team, same thing, super regimented training program, like you're going to school and, and then it's like every single question they had pop in their head, they're texting and calling us and they can't think for themselves. If there is one nugget people take away from this, it's that 
you should probably like the chaos of building that bridge from going from being a solo agent to building a team. The chaos is actually very empowering because it requires your agents to be very resourceful to figure things out on their own. Yeah. And, and there's this balance, right? Because on the one hand you're like, well, but if they're too resourceful, they're going to leave. If they can figure it out on their own, why do they need me? So we have this, we have this, it's, it's a constant dance that we're doing. Um, and, and I think that's where the, the leadership piece um, really is. If, if we've done well hiring and if we've done well providing a very good framework for training. So it's really having a training program that teaches people how to fish, that does enable their critical thinking. And then if we become leaders, and this was another thing that I, I learned um, in, my, in my journey, and that is to empower people, um, which sounds obvious, but I have a really strong work ethic. I know you do too, and I am positive, 100% positive, anybody who is in your group who is watching this this webinar has a strong work ethic. Um, and it's so disappointing when you are, you've built a phenomenal program for someone and an, you've given someone such an opportunity and they're not seizing it. Um, it gets, it can become frustrating. And so I would show that frustration. So we would do our power ups every day, every morning. And sometimes I would come in and I'm just like, I'm kind of beating everybody down. Like I'm pissed. We haven't met our goals. You know, what were you doing? You get, do, do the round robin. Let's do the scorecard. You suck. You suck. You suck. Why did you suck? You know, like you've got everything. I don't understand it. Get out there and put on your game face and kill it. You know, that is not the way to lead a sales meeting. FYI. Um, because I, I learned that it's so much more effective when we empower people. And as a leader, if we can, if we can master that, we're going to have a lot more success and no, it's not, it's not going to, we're not going to have a hundred percent success. There's you know, gonna be 20 something interesting about that is as a salesperson, you learn this process to take the consumer through self discovery to lead them to their end conclusion, right? And so it's, you know, in terms of being a great leader, you have to take the people you're leading through that same process of self dis self discovery to to see if if in fact the person sitting in front of you um, really is going to be committed to doing what it takes to succeed. And sometimes they have ahas like, you know what, this isn't actually what I want to be doing. And so the faster you can realize that, it's kind of like a buyer or seller lead, the faster you realize whether you should be working with them or not. Exactly. Because time's valuable and let's just cut bait if it's not a fit. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a hundred, that is a hundred percent correct. And it's the same thing with, you know, anybody who has kids, it's the <laughs> same thing. You learn, you learn how to parent that. And if you can facilitate your children learning what their gifts are and playing to their gifts and to their strengths, um, I just had so many people who would come in and we would do our weekly accountability and they just felt like they were in trouble. You know, mm -hmm. it's like they're going to the principal's office and they felt like they were in trouble and, um, and they kind of were. And so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was not, you know, that was not the most effective. So um, fast forward a couple more years. I mean, let's see, 2016, you won innovator of the year award. Um, 2017, Innovator, influencer by Inman News. For you guys that don't know Inman, <laughs> you should definitely go check that out. Um, I actually just got back from Inman this past week in New York. Um, so uh, I'm kind of curious, where are you trying to take this uh, training organization you've created? Um, you're going to stay focused in real estate. That's going to be your niche. Like, what's what's next for you? Yeah. So. Um... I have a core belief and, and my whole faculty at, at the Alumni Institute has a core belief that the family law system is broken and the way that real estate is mishandled in family law has a major impact on families. 
it also has a major impact on the court system and on the way that attorneys practice. Realtors have got answers and resources and expertise that the family law system needs. And so at Alumni, we are about training and teaching realtors to take their expertise and become the subject matter expert that courts, lawyers, and divorcing litigants need. Um, our, our end game is for the alumni directory of CDREs is the place that lawyers go all over the country when they need a realtor, just like, just like you mentioned, they give three names, right? Mm -hmm. Where do they get those three names? Half the time it's the lawyers drive into, drive into court in the morning and they pass a, a for sale sign in their neighborhood. That's a name. Yeah. So horrible. It, it's horrible. And so instead of that, um, it, it needs to be that qualified experts uh, is the, the only resource for, for, law, for lawyers and courts to even consider finding agents. So our directory is that, is that place and lawyers nationwide, divorcing litigants nationwide, when they need a realtor in a case, they go to the Alumni Institute and find a CDRE in their area. You are um, a big thinker and you're a driver. Um, what, I'm, this is totally out of left field, totally unrelated to, um, uh, you know, the, the Institute and everything, but something I feel like I've kind of stumbled upon and I'm kind of curious if you've maybe made the same realization is that the real estate industry is not as big as I thought. Like there's, you know, 2 million real estate agents, I think is what NER says somewhere in there. It seems like a lot of people, but like it's it's actually not that big of an industry from a business perspective, you know, like um, again, I'm asking this because you're this hard charging, high driving type, you know, personality and, um, and I'm the exact same way. And I'm curious, you know, um, and the reason I keep saying certified distressed properties is because the guy that started that, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So he got out of real estate and, you know, I think, I don't know if he closed down his institute or whatever, because he had this aha that um, the industry wasn't as big as he thought. Like, for example, if you can create a product, a, a course, an institute that is marketing to 63 million small businesses versus 2 million real estate agents, you know, you can have a much larger business. And so I, he's, you know, I've, I've got, what's his name? He always wears the red what? glasses. I like I'm sitting here trying to remember and for whatever reason I can't remember but he started he started building it in 06 07 when the market yeah. crashed in Florida and yeah. he relocated to Austin Texas I should know his name because he's like down the lives down the road from me um anyways he always wears red glass the point is um I'm kind of curious like you know there there is a ceiling for us in the real estate industry which is crazy to think because you know uh you know, there's just, you know, a finite number of agents and a number of people you can work with, et cetera. Um, have you realized that? And are you okay with that? And you just want to be like, you want your legacy to be known as having this, you know, massive impact, which already you've already done. And you've been, you know, many people have, um, you know, Inman, you know, Brad Inman as an influencer for your contributions to this industry in the real estate space. Is, is that what you hope your legacy to be in you know, when you look back on your career one day? It is. That's, yeah. It is. Yep. This is, this is <clears throat> what I want my, my legacy to be. I want, um, I want families who are going through what is probably the biggest crisis in their lives, um, who are put in the wrong hands right now and whose trajectory depends a lot on how the house in their case is handled. Um, I want my legacy to be that it's absolutely unacceptable for that to be mediocrity. Um, it needs, we, there needs to be reform and there need to be qualified professionals out there doing it. And uh, that's until that happens. Um, I've got, I've got uh, job security. <laughs> 
That's exciting. Let me, um, Laurel, when is, when is your next class or conference or like, where can people, you know, if someone's watching this, they're super excited about the opportunity to go after this niche and they want to take action right now, where can they go to start learning how to, um, you know, start going after this niche and, and finding success? Sure. So I've got three things. One is we, we have a Facebook group that is um, very, it, it, we, we put a lot of information in there. It's called the Divorce Real Estate and Lending Mastermind. And we do webinars just like, uh, just like you're doing. We do Ask the Experts. And so there's a lot of great information there. Anybody can go there now and, um, and become a member of, of that Facebook group. Scroll through and you'll find stuff. Um, the second thing is, I, I recommend people start with our online program. We have an online eight weeks to success. That actually begins February 11th. Wow, that's coming up. It's coming up. It's Tuesday. Four days. Wow. Yeah. So um, you'll see me like this in this setting. Um, and we will do an online. It's eight weeks. It's group coaching. And you'll come away with the tools to really handle these listings and a huge insight in how you can build this business. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, like I said, you go to the divorce niche.com and you can find information about that. Cool. And then the third thing is our CDRE program. So we do that twice a year. It's a six month program and it starts with one week here in Southern California with our faculty and we do a major dive. That's where you, you truly become an expert in this space. We go to the courthouse, we have lunch with judges. I mean, it's a very interactive, uh, extremely uh, powerful week and it, the apprenticeship goes on for six months. That next course is, is April 19th. And for information on that, you go to getdivorcecertified.com. Laurel, before we go, I got to ask you, how did the name Alumni, how did you, how did that name come up? Because I keep calling it, I keep thinking oh, Illuminati. How did, this, how did this name come up? While you were talking, I Googled it because I'm like, what does Illuminati mean? Yeah. So the, uh, we wanted a name that truly reflects who we are. And so we, our core principles are light, skill, knowledge, and truth. And through that, we create community and purpose. And the an alumni is a combination of Latin words that mean that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, great. So um, everybody can go check out the divorce niche and go to your website, check out the Institute. And this is your full time thing. Now you're not you know, you're like you're full time helping people across the country be experts at this niche. So um, that's really awesome. I'm honored to have you on here. It's really cool to be talking to somebody that's, um, you know, been awarded, uh, you know, with so many accolades and um, the Inman influencer and in Inman innovator. That's a huge one. So congrats on everything you've done. And I, th I think that's so awesome. You're, uh, you know, what, what you're doing in the, in the community to help the um, real estate industry. So thank you for being on the, uh, the podcast today. It has been a pleasure, Chris. Thank you so much. And if you hopefully come back to, down to San Diego, then we can go have lunch or something. Oh God. I love San Diego and Coronado Island. Oh right, man. It's right. so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That bridge always freaks me out going over that bridge into Coronado. I forget. I, <laughs> I was at, actually, I was totally fine going across the bridge and then my wife started freaking out. And then like in my, I got in my head, my hands started sweating. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Oh so, <laughs> well, Hey, for everybody tuning in on Facebook, if you guys have any questions, if you're watching this on Facebook, comment on the, uh, uh, in the comment section below and um, we'll get you any questions you have answered. And um, don't forget, we're giving away a copy of the book, The Million Dollar Real Estate Team for free. Um, all you gotta do is pay, cover the cost of shipping and handling and you get a copy of it. And um, check out, uh, again, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can also watch this podcast, CEO Secrets on iTunes. Laurel, thank you so much for being on and um, hopefully I'll, I'll see you soon. Thank you for all that you do in the space. Take care, Chris. Bye.